Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next webinar for the NHATConnect.com series. Uh, we're going to talk today about using the built-in accessibility features of your technology, a favorite topic of ours as we go forward. Uh, you can get the slides uh, if you would like them, and, and I'll give you a, a rationale of why you might want the slides. So the slides are at that shortened link. It is bit.ly slash NHAT dash A11Y, which is a shortened abbreviation for the word accessibility, in case you're wondering. Uh, so the slides will be there. One of the reasons I would think you might want the slides is within the slides, pictures are linked to web resources, videos are embedded there if you'd like to go back and watch them. So it might be easier to have those. I don't think we'll play all the videos in the webinar today, but they're there if you need them and you want to go through them. So just a heads up that uh, the slides will be beneficial to that. And this is us. Jen, you want to say hi first? Hey, folks. I'm so excited for this session. This is so powerful. There are so many things that are built in now. I mean, over the years, so much has been added. So I'm glad to be your co-pilot. So I'm Jennifer Edge Savage. I'm an occupational therapist, an assistive technology specialist, and AAC consultant, um, and kind of co-manager of this NHAT, NHAT Connect project with Mike Murata. Hello, everybody. So I'm an assistive technology specialist, or if you go with my made up title of myself there, I'm an inclusive technology evangelist. I like that. Exciting. Yelling from the rooftops how great and important inclusive and accessible technology is. And like Jen, I am also one of the co-project managers of this project, this NHAT Connect. If you have not heard of our project and you are in New Hampshire, well, do we have something for you? Uh, so our, our goal of our project, we have been tasked through this partnership with the Department of Ed to connect local school-based teams with resources they might need in order to build capacity to meet the needs of their students with disabilities. So really exciting. Uh, it's a fun project because we get to work with teams across an entire school year, which is really fun. It's not kind of a one-hit presentation and then hope for the best, but instead it really it enables us to build a group that has complementary skills and a depth of knowledge about assistive technology uh, to really change the way their schools provide AT to the students with disabilities. Yeah, our goal is to really make folks fearless, give them enough support and enough information, enough practice in a safe and hopefully fun environment um, to feel like we can do this and we'll continue to learn and figure things out and maybe um, create some real change in providing access for our students. So it's sure. been a lot of fun. So we're recording this at the end, uh, actually at the end of April in 2024. So we are starting to think about our project groups for the next school year, which would be the 24-25 school year. Maybe we even say that, but yeah, 24-25. So if you're interested- We're gonna get up there, unless you've done that already, like let's get folks right. joining. We, we have information on our website. You could certainly click there and find out more. If you or your team are interested, reach out, and we would love to chat with you about it. And like I mentioned before, our, our work is, is supported through the Department of Ed, the Special Education Bureau. Uh, you see on the screen their focuses of what they are addressing um, in order to support learners across New Hampshire. Our project is focused on this one component of assistive technology in this bigger overall um, goal of the department. Mm -hmm. So as we start to dive in, Jen said this is one of the most favorite ones to talk about, and I agree. This is one of my most favorite topics to talk about uh, because it reminds people that you have incredible power right around you. As you're watching this, I know your phone is somewhere near you. I just know it is. I don't even know you, but I know your phone is, but Jen just looked for hers. I just picked up mine, right? I, it's, it's always there. Uh, and what's interesting about that, that people I don't think even realize the power of your phone, your phone or your tablet, if you have a, an iPad or an Android tablet, 
your phone is 1 million times more powerful than the spaceship that landed on the moon. This is uh, mind blowing, but I mean, technology does change at an exponential rate. This exactly. Makes I don't even and know this, if you made that up, but I believe it. It's 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 legit. the The article is linked in the picture. Go back to my <laughs> rationale for downloading the slides. You can click on the picture, and it'll take you to the article that talks about that. Um, yeah, I'm not just pulling numbers out of my my head here. I'm, I've actually hunted that down. But I think what's interesting, and the reminder about that. And the moment to ask people is, okay, you have this incredibly powerful tool in your fingertips. How are you using it? Are you only using it for text, email, social media? Or are you maximizing it and customizing it to be a tool that works for you and is... Um, giving you all of the resources you need to be successful. And, and I'm specifically saying you and not even saying someone with a disability or a student that you're working with. I'm saying you, these are the features that we're going to go through them and talk about them. I'm going to tell you a large chunk of these I already have on, on my phone because I use them. And I just, they're customizing my experience of my phone to make it easier as I go forward to complete tasks. So when we think about that, the power of this, every device you have, it doesn't matter to us what you have in front of, of you. Any device you have has these features in it. Yep. We are, right? We're in this, this really exciting time, Jen, where it's not like, oh, I can only do that if I have this one computer or I have to go buy this extra software. Now it's any computer, any smartphone, any tablet, you can have text-to-speech, speech-to-text, the ability to have the screen narrated for you. These things are just built in across the board. does not matter what you and have. More now, more some of them work better than others, but yeah. they are all there. And some of them like work great as they are, and some, okay, that's great, but you might need something that's not built in. But it get you can immediately start exploring and trying. And I always challenge folks, like, what are you actually using on your phone? Have you ever made the connection that maybe that would be something that would be helpful for your student to manage some tasks that they're struggling with? And I think having this more and more built in just makes it less and less of a stigma. If you need to see something like voice recognition to speak what you want to write um, or need to listen, with, read with your ears instead of your eyes. So it's such an exciting time. It's changing so fast. It's getting better and better. I'm not sure if it makes our job easier though. Um, yeah, I don't but know there's does. so much. I don't know, it, it makes our access to things for our job easier, which is yes, good. It does. Yes, uh, it does. You know, and I think it, to go along with, with what Jen just said, the, the importance of these built in features is they can act a bit like a proof of concept. Like, I think something is going to work, but I'm not sure. Mm. Why don't you try the built in features? See if you can meet that person's needs before you go to an app store and buy anything. Right. Any of the things we're talking about, there are apps for them. I mean, we, we already mentioned the idea of text-to-speech being built into your devices. Text-to-speech is there. That doesn't mean there aren't hundreds of, of apps that will give you text-to-speech and other features right? if you need them. And I think that's the really important piece is don't forget about the need that that person has. And, and we point people all the time back to something called the set framework and whether it, it was designed for students in, in schools k-12 to as a framework to look at how we approach technology support but we can also address this to adults as well so that s can be student can be just someone it could just be a person mm -hmm. what are their skills and abilities what do they do um, what do they like and dislike what have they tried what's worked what hasn't um, the environments they're going to use technology in the tasks they need to do, and then finally look at the tools. This is a framework that reminds people to don't worry about the tools right away. Worry about what it is you need. And if you determine that the need is met by a built-in feature, congratulations, you've done it. Like Jen said, a lot of times this doesn't make our job easier, but in some instances it does. Person's like, well, right that there. works perfectly for me. Great, <laughs> good. Literally at our fingertips, you know. Yeah. My enormous texts 
that you can I, probably- I was thinking the same thing, <laughs> right? That idea of, of, of just the features that we use every day to customize it for ourselves. And I love how you talk about with a set framework that we are all so deeply embedded in. Just switching that to someone so you start figuring out maybe what your mom or dad needs or grandpa needs to have access to things that they love when they're losing their vision, you know, or losing some um, dexterity. It's amazing. It's amazing. And then this idea of when we started out saying before you and pointing to your, your phone and things like that, things you could use, if you are someone who is tasked with getting others excited about technology, this might be your path to get others excited because this is something that might resonate with everyone. Just about, I'll even say just about, just about everybody has a smartphone, not everybody, but just about everybody. Um, this is something they carry around all day with them. You can, in that you can teach them to embrace the idea of these customizations using their own tech, that it's going to help them as they go forward. Jen mentioned her large print. I also have the large print on my phone. Love it. If you took it, if you took it from me, I might fight you. That's how much I love it because it's so important for me to use on my phone. I think that's a really important thing to remember to is, is make this real for people. It demystifies assistive technology a little bit and they forget this myth that AT is really expensive and really complicated. And then you can quickly dispel that and say, no, it's the thing you carry in your pocket all day long and you already have it. So it. It's an instant way we can dispel that, which is great. Which is great. Here's our thought as we go through this. Is it the best way to do this? I don't know, but it's the way we're going to do it for the next little chunk of time. We're going to go platform by platform and talk about things. So we will talk about Apple products, iOS products, your iPhone, your iPad. We will talk about Android products. We'll talk about Windows and Microsoft tools. And then we'll finally talk about Chrome. That's our plan as we go through. What we may see is front loading a lot of conversation now, because as we said, a lot of these features appear in other tools too. So we'll address them in other tools, but may not go as deep into them because we've already talked the depth about what those do. So hopefully that makes sense. Like I mentioned before, lots of videos, lots of links to things. In fact, if you go back to sorry, this slide, which has all the logos on it, if you have the slides, each of these pictures will take you to the accessibility page for that manufacturer. So if you want to get all the information, click there. It'll take you to their websites, which have all their info. I'll say that before we move there. All right, you ready, Jen? I am ready. iOS, let's talk about that. You know, as we go through, and, and it's always interesting, you know, one of the things people will always ask Jen or myself is, which one is best? Mm, which mm. tool is best? Which app is best? A lot of things about best. And I don't like to say best, except when I'm going to qualify it here, where I talk about the most features. Mm. So if we're talking about the most built-in features of a platform, your iPhone and iPad wins that battle. It's just more realized. There are so many features in the accessibility settings of your iDevices. Some that don't exist in any other platform. And yeah. we'll talk about a few of them, that this is the only place you can get them. So if best means most, then I would say this is the best. And I, I just think that an iPhone and an iPad gives you the most flexibility and opportunity to customize the experience for some. Does that make it the best? I don't know. You decide. Yeah, it seems so like a we'll fair talk. way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, right? I, I think this idea of, you know, just about can, can I put one of these devices in front of a person and have the best chance of possibly meeting their needs? I think an iPhone or iPad gives you that possibility because of all it has. And you get a list on the side of some of the features that are there. And we'll talk about some of them as we move through. Um, but you have the ability to have things spoken out loud. You can magnify text. You have zooms. You can adjust the fonts. Uh, you have captions. You have something called assistive touch, which we'll look at. Um, this is a bit of a snapshot. 
as you go into your iPhone or iPad, go into the settings, head right over to accessibility. It's right there in the main tree now, which is really exciting because previously accessibility had been buried under general. So people had to know, click general, then accessibility, and then get to the features. Well, now it's just there. And I think one of the bonuses that that's given us is more people have probably explored this just because it's there. And I think that's a positive step. So where do we start? We always start with the talk about text-to-speech. I feel it's one of those features that is A, simple to turn on and have on forever and just be there ready to go. And it, that's, it, it provides an opportunity to give the most support to a widest, the widest group of needs um, quickly. And so this one is one that I always think in one of my slight frustrations about the iDevices is that this feature is just not on automatically. It should be default. It's just such a great feature for so many needs. Same students with, with dys, dyslexia, learning disabilities, uh, vision impairments, like uh, English Cognitive language. Cognitive impairments. It could be any of these things. Everything. Just yeah. to have it read and have things in multiple means, have that input coming in a different way is just so helpful for so many of us. And one of the things that's so powerful about this feature, so in the iDevices, you get two options for text-to-speech. So this is text on the screen that is read aloud by a computer-generated voice. That's text-to-speech. You get the option to do a speak selection. Now, if you notice the little video clip that's not started yet, but you see the, the thumbnail of it, I think we're all probably pretty familiar on an iPhone with if you hold down your finger on something to select it, that black bar pops up. The black bar, copy and paste, share, look up. When you turn on speak selection in your accessibility settings, another button appears on that menu that says speak. So now right away, we've dropped this accessibility feature into a menu people are familiar with. They inherently know how to use because it pops up all the time. And so I'll give you a quick sense of that in a video. And by the way, Jen and I were talking before we started, I tried to embed videos in this so we didn't have this whole issue of trying to connect my phone to the Zoom at the same time. So that's part of the rationale of why we have these little video clips. It just makes it easier for us to move through them. So here we go. We're gonna hold our finger down on some text. We're going to select it and then look speak is there. It's safe, secure, and confidential. Your information and privacy are protected. It's as easy as that. And as you notice, a couple things there. All right, Jen, what do we notice? A couple things. What are they? I was really loving how it highlighted or it indicated each word as it was spoken because we know that is so helpful for literacy. That's the word, that's what it looks like. Here's what it sounds like at the same time. Correct, and then you even see that point where the selected text was in one color, the word being spoken was in a different color, again, to provide some more support, both to where am I on the screen and what word am I hearing currently? So you get that dual support yep. for highlighting. Um, voice, sounds great. Sounded crystal clear. Great voice. And we and we say that purposely for those individuals who sometimes will say, I don't like that these voices are robotic. And I think we've now moved to a spot in time with technology that these voices are not that robotic anymore. They, they have a really um, nice sound to them. Are they people? No, but they are still quite... Um, easy to listen to, and, and they have a nice sound to them. One of the other things I like to remind people is don't let your own personal bias about a computer-generated voice impact another user. Jen yeah. and I see this a lot with kids where yeah. the adults in the room will say, I hate a computer voice. And then you talk to a student, they never once bring up the issue of the computer voice. There is no issue there at all. And so if there's not an issue, let's not make an issue. It's true. We don't need to force our biases on them. Let's see what they think. Because this is not designed for us. This is for them. If you need it, you don't. And you can be independent. There's less care what that voice sounds like. It just doesn't matter, right? It's, it's so getting the information I need, right? 
Yeah. So, so we see speak selection. We don't have a video of this one, but another option for reading is called speak screen. You have the same voice, the same highlighting, all of those same features that you get as output. But you are now, instead of having to select text on the screen with your finger and then draw the little bubbles out, you simply swipe down from the top of the screen with two fingers and your device will read everything on that page. Really nice. If you're reading something that's long, if you're in a book or some kind of do other long document, a web page that you want to read, you don't want to keep highlighting things or highlight too much, you can swipe down and have it read for you. There's a little controller that'll pop up on the screen to give you the ability to pause and play and move back and forth. So you get some of those options. Nice, nice speech features. Voiceover. Also speech output, but different. Mm -hmm. Voiceover is a screen reader. Typically designed for individuals with visual impairments, I'm going to take a step back from that and say, again, it's providing audio support. If you need this level of audio support, regardless of your disability, this should be the tool you use. So I don't want people to say, well, that's, I, I'm not blind. I don't need that. It could be for any number of users. So the main difference of a voiceover or a screen reader tool is not only does it read the text, it reads everything on the page aloud. So here, let's get a sense of what that sounds like. VoiceOver on CarPlay. United States Census 2020. Image. Navigation. Landmark. Menu. Button. And. Navigation. Collab menu expanded. Frequently asked questions link. Instructions link. The 2020 census questionnaire should be completed by the person who owns or rents the. Okay, so then it reads like it would if we selected the text. As we listen to that, you got a whole lot of audio support there. So you heard some stuff there, even before all of those things it read, it read before it actually got to the text. So now you, what you can't see on that screen as I'm doing it is I'm dragging my finger across the page and that's when it was announcing things. So right away you heard it turn on, it said voiceover on, it said car play. It's not gonna say that all the time. I recorded this sitting in my car. So my car was connected to my phone, so it knew that. Um, that's great. But then it's, I should always take that part out, but I like the voiceover on part. Um, <laughs> it had the picture at the top left corner. It told you it was an image. It told you it was navigation, meaning it was in the navigation bar. And it was a landmark orienting you to this icon is at the top left corner of your screen. So now I know without being able to see the screen potentially where I am on the screen. Because remember, if I can't see the screen, it is a piece of glass. I might not have a sense of where I am on the on the screen. So it orients me. Then I found the menu. It said it was collapsed. I tapped it. It expanded. I moved down. It told me the names, frequently asked questions, link, instructions, link. I selected it. It brought me to the instructions page and started to read it. So you get all of that audio support. Now, for some people, that's too much audio. For others, those are very powerful guides to move them through the screen. What do you think about voiceover, Jen? I think for if you need it, this is amazing. Like this is a, a smartphone is a sheet of glass and it's fully accessible if you are blind because it's giving the auto prompts where everybody is. There's no tactile cues. So those auditory prompts are amazing. If you don't need it and benefit more from that select specific text to get support with, that, that you have these options built into your phone now is just mind blowing to me. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, I think it's great. And this again brings us back to the example of the set framework and what does the person need? Here, we just gave you three choices to hear things out loud, mm -hmm. depending on your level of need. 
you change and you use them at different times. That's okay too, depending on the task. It's always working its way back to the set framework uh, and giving us that guidance of what is it we're trying to do at any given time. Yeah, and that was a great way to the difference between just a text reader, text to speech versus a screen reader where you're going to know your location too. And you're going to know what images are and links are and have all of that auditory support. It's huge. Yeah, Built in, one, great. One, I, I work with an individual with a cognitive impairment and, and they struggle to recognize the icons on their home screen by picture. They don't know the picture, but when they hear it, that's what I want. And then they click it. And so for them, that is actually the only time they use voiceovers when they're navigating the main screen and then they turn it off and then they just go through their thing because they're not comfortable moving around their screen um, visually to select icons. We talked about um, voice control or using speech to text, using your voice to do something. We have the speech to text, which might be the microphone that shows up in your keyboard. Sorry, the box got a little messed up there, but the box is supposed to be on the button with the, with the microphone on it. So you have that. We have Siri that can provide some help. So you have the ability with your voice to type text, ask questions and receive answers all through voice. And if you're in an iOS device, you get this new feature using your voice called voice control, which allows you with only your voice to move in and out of any app on your device and control it, anything. Simply turn it on, your device always is listening for you and then responding to your requests. Open Gmail, open Safari, all of, new tab, all of those things, address bar, and then tell it what you want to do, and it's going to take you there. These are the kind of things you can do with your voice. So this is a newer feature with voice control, but gives you much um, better, a deeper control. And and the picture I put there is my favorite because if you're if you're an old time assistive technology person, you remember Dragon Naturally Speaking with mouse grid. The whole yeah. idea being if I needed to move my cursor on the screen. How did I do that? What you would say in Dragon Natural Speaking is mouse grid. In here, you would say show grid. The grid pops up on your screen and you'll notice in that grid, in that center picture, there are gray numbers. Announce the number and the grid contracts to that number and then gives you additional numbers. And so what it's allowing you to do is pinpoint your cursor on a screen before you select. So for something, if you're using an app, that requires very fine control of where you tap on the screen. You can do that using that grid feature and then perform the tasks. I, I work with an individual who does graphic design and they use the voice grid, they use the grid to narrow down the spot on the screen where they're gonna start the line that they draw. So it clicks and then they're able to move the line um, with just by simply drawing across the page, but they need that fine control to get to that spot. It, it's outstanding. What I would warn you, if you see the third picture there, it is going to kill your battery. Ah, fair. fair. It is running all the time. So if you're in a device where you don't get through a day anyway, this will really um, brutally affect your, your battery life. So if, you, if you're going to have an individual who needs this, my suggestion is have a plan for backup power. Battery packs. A battery pack, a charging pack, even if it's just a cord and a plug that they have throughout the day, they can find some place to plug in um, because they're going to need it. Because it is really, I mean, you could turn this on and as you're talking about, you can watch the percentages drop down in your battery. Sometimes. So keep that in mind as you go forward. Yeah, not for everybody, but another feature for people. We mentioned assistive touch. This is a feature that you only see on the iDevices, and it allows you to control the physical buttons that are on your device. Most of it is glass and it's touch, but there are buttons. There's the power button. There's the, the volume up and down. There's the lock button. Uh, there's the 
functions you perform by pushing multiple buttons at the same time, if I don't have that physical access, I can turn on assistive touch and then control that all from the screen. I get these boxes that pop up on the screen and allow me to simply select it to perform that task. This is for, for people who had older mobile devices where your home button broke. Um, this is how you would fix it to not have to buy a new phone. You would turn on assistive touch. <laughs> I got to effectively do that to my daughter once who said, bad news, I need a new phone. And I said, good news, I can turn this on. And then you don't. And she was really excited, as you can imagine. <laughs> Fabulous. Guided access. Jen, you want to talk about guided access? I feel like every parent knows about guided access. And in case you don't, um, guided access just gives you the ability to lock um, to lock someone into an app. So if you're trying to focus someone attention to a certain app, sometimes this is true for communication apps or to a school-based app, you don't want them getting into other parts of the phone. If you're a parent who lets your, you know, your child use your phone or your iPad, you can lock them into the app they want so they don't start messing around and changing your Siri name to Chero or something like that, that my kids did. But you can keep them contained. Um, I have not, I'm gonna admit, I've not played around with the newest features of guided access where you can actually have multiple apps now. You, you mean this one? Yes. Assistive access. Very cool. So the newest ver the newest addition to kind of the the idea of guided access is something called assistive access. Because one of the big complaints about guided access was I get one thing. That's one. it. Yeah. Now with assistive access, so this showed up in iOS 17. So pretty recent. So it's pretty yeah. new. Yeah. Um, and what it allows you to do is pick a few things that you can have access to. So on the screen is an example of a simplified home screen in two different views, in a tile view, mm -hmm. that would be considered a tile. And then the other would be a list, um, but it shows you some of the apps you can choose to get into. And then look at that third picture is a person in their message app, but look at the simplicity of it all of a sudden. It's got the message, I can do a video selfie or use the keyboard or use the emojis. And it's right there as simple buttons. Really cool. Really interesting way to give people access to more of their device, but yet still provide some simpler way to do that. It's funny that this says mom. I think this is what I'm going to do to my mom's phone. I, I think that's a very uh, specific thing that Apple chose to do in that picture, but I agree. I think it's a great idea. Um, it goes both ways for your kids and for your parents. Like to yeah, to make it simple to go baby. through yeah. here. And so yeah. this is the newest one. Really great. This is one of those examples. This feature only lives on the iDevices. You're not going to see this on anything else. So when you start trying to decide what is the right tool for me, these have to start weighing into that decision. Guided access only available on the iDevices. It'd be great for classrooms and management of the apps, the school apps that they need to access to. Yeah, right. This would be great if I had access to a couple things, including maybe the camera, if I needed to take a picture in the room of something. For safety, yeah. for cognitive access. So to get, so I don't know if we share, like to get in and out of it, you set a pass, you set a passcode for it. So you really, if you try to get out and do something else, it's going to ask for the passcode. And if not, right. it's going to keep you in. Yeah, and if you don't know the passcode, you're going to get stuck in there. So it's really, it, it's a, this is a really interesting extension of your guided access, which I love. And then what we're seeing in a lot of the devices more and more is the ability to do alternate access with switches. So some kind of external device to choose things on the screen for our mobile devices. Again, if we're thinking about if you need alternate access for an individual, I kind of think the best platform for you is going to be an iPad or an iPhone. Yeah. I, I, the, the features that are built into the switch control and the iDevices are much more realized than the other tools. They are in the other ones. Um, but this gives you a lot more features of the kind of how many switches you can use, the way they interact with the device, pauses, repeats, the presses, all of those things. They also have something in iOS called recipes, where you can create a series of functions 
that happen with one switch click. So think about an app you get into quite a bit on your iPad that has some pretty straightforward things you do each time in order to access something. Um, you could create a recipe and by simply one click of a switch, the device would perform all of those functions. The person wouldn't have to. You know what this worked great with the recipes? Fruit Ninja. Perfect. Fruit Ninja. It's those uh, swipes. Yeah, you got to swipe yeah. a couple switches with a couple different swipe patterns. Right. And my kids who could not use their hands to play could tap their switches with their head or their knee. And, and be they're able to getting and they're something getting on their them. screen. And you think about how you would do that for Fruit Ninja on a screen is that that's not simply a tap. That is a swipe across the screen. Mm -hmm. If I'm unable to do that, a switch won't let me do a swipe. A switch will let me do a click or a touch. So the recipe is actually following the motion of those slices just from that single click. Yeah, it creates that whole, the whole gesture that you're creating. Every, it's capturing what you would do on the screen. It's really, really cool. We're, and things are getting really interesting with switches too, with people 3D printing switches, you know, giving switches away for free. You could purchase switches. I will say that with switches you purchase last forever. Um, but you do need something that's going to convert what those switches, those clicks to something like a, a switch interface or something. Which are in those two items on the right hand side, as Jen's pointing out, those that that's your in between step between your device and your switch. Something has to live in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> does yeah. the magic. The magic happens in that little box right there. Um, because you don't plug switches directly into a mobile device. You can try, but we can tell you it's not going to go well. <laughs> or, or or a computer or Chromebook either. You're going to need some sort of interface. Going to need something. Access devices. Um, some AAC devices are going to have built-in ports that are already, the device is the interface. But your typical out-of-the-box iPad, Chromebook, you're going to need a switch interface to talk with it. Yeah. And, and then when you think about switches, you want to know what's being controlled with that switch. How much of the access am I going to get to the features of each app I want to use? On the iDevices, on the iPhone and iPad, you go into the App Store and you see that an app is voiceover accessible, it is then switch accessible because yep. they use the same functions in the iPad because not yeah. every app is going to be switch accessible. Yeah, not every mini app is going to create those kind of, of, of indicate those specific kind of buttons or placeholder. Right. But if it's voiceover accessible, it's reading each section and explaining it. That means it's going to, that's a great way to talk about it. It's going to be switch accessible. They're not all going to be, and it will default to kind of a scanning access. So we're talking about switches, which are separate, not built in, but that all of these, this was not always true for iOS, that all of this is built in to our phones and our iPads. So that if we do need that, we can do all of this stuff is tremendous. You don't need separate software to do this. Amazing. Just, I mean, this used to this used to require a computer with yeah, extra yeah. software in there and extra hardware and all these other pieces. And then you were kind of tethered to a desk because you had all this stuff with you. Yeah. Now that's not the case anymore. Very cool. Great. All right. iOS, not everything, but a oh. snapshot. We could have hung out with iOS for days, but yeah. We could have hung out with most of these for a large chunk of days, it's right? Correct. Yeah. Taste. That's a taste for wanting taste. more and joining our, one of our teams. Yeah. And, or now this is going to encourage you to go out and find some more about your devices. Let's talk about Android. This will go a little faster because we already talked about it with iOS. One thing to remember about Android that's a little different from your iOS devices on your iPhone and iPad. If you're updated to the newest operating system. Everybody's phone and everybody's iPad works exactly the same way is not the case for for Android devices. Android devices are manufacturer specific because mm. Android is an open system that allows manufacturers to change the way it works, add things in, take things away. So your first thing you need to do with an Android device is go into your settings, go into about and find out what version of Android you are running. That will tell you what features you're going to be able to have. So when you go to the Android accessibility page on the website, it will tell you the feature and what version of Android it runs in and then beyond. So maybe it's version eight and above. 
version seven and above. You're gonna to need to find that and know what version you're running. Because what happens, Android devices are very popular. They're less expensive typically than iPhones and iPads. There's many more of them out there. Uh, I do a lot of work with adults also. And when I'm working with adults with smartphones, I have a lot of opportunities where people are on these smartphone plans, the kind of the pay as you go plan. We'll give you a phone and we'll give you a certain amount of minutes and you add minutes to it every month. Great, whatever. Gets technology in people's hands. That's awesome. Uh, but some of these Android devices, while they are smartphones, run a lower version of the operating system, which might not have these features on it. Mm -hmm. You can go online and purchase an Android tablet for $60 that will do everything an Android tablet will do, except some of these built-in features because it doesn't run a new enough system. So always check that with Android. That's the first thing you have to do with Android is just understand what you have. But then once you're in there, your settings, go to accessibility. The list here looks pretty similar to what you got from your iOS devices. You get text-to-speech, you get screen reading, the ability to change the display and the font, magnifications. There is some switch access. So we get those same types of features. The trick becomes figuring out what they're called from device to device. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's always the trick. In, in iOS, so the iPhone is called speak selection. In the Android, it's called select to speak. It does the same function. Here's the little video of an Android tablet working. The end result will be text to speech, but the process is a little different. And I have a little icon on the side. I tap it. Then I highlight some text. The first step in designing starts reading. authentically inclusive educational experiences is believing that it can be done. Adop There's pause buttons and things like that. But you see the difference there. Think about what we showed you in the iOS. You selected the text, then chose the button to speak. In an Android, you, you select the button and then the text. Mm -hmm. Feature is the same. Function is a little different on how you get to it. So again, it's it's going to be a learning curve for some people, especially if they're moving back and forth between things. That that could really, they got to take a minute and figure out where they are and what device before they start using it. Screen readers, we won't go into that, but the video is there. It's the same thing. On iOS, it's called voiceover. On an Android, it's called talkback. Same idea. Reads all of the screen elements, and that is your screen reader component. Do you have voice access on Android? I told you these would be faster. Yes, same thing. I have speech to text. I also have the ability to speak to my device and have an assistant provide some support for me. Same idea as we had in iOS. Do you have switches? Sure. If your Android version is, is version five and above. So if you buy one of these you know, $30, $40 Android tablets, or you get an Android tablet that's like from like um, one of the book readers, like a like a Nook. Those are still kind of around or a Kindle Fire. Um, those have their own proprietary version of Android. So you're not going to see that feature in there. So know what you need. You need five and above for Android. And then you'll have some features. The features for switches are are OK in Android. They are not as robust as the iOS features they just aren't um, so know that going in I think You're, if that if alternate access is going to be important for you an iDevice might be the better one do you have live captions you do you have built in live captions so that if your device is playing audio it will it will display captions on the screen live captions has been a feature of android since android 10 where you'll just be able to have it on your iPhone and iPad, live captions in the last iOS, so in 17, is a beta version. It does work, um, but it's still work. There. I think they're still working the kinks out a bit. I would imagine in the next rollout of your operating system, that will be kind of fully realized. But video calls, videos that you're watching, whatever it might be, your captions will pop up on the screen. 
one thing that Android has that an iOS phone doesn't have. So I like to point these out to people sometimes. It is not built in, but it is an Android app that you can install for free. So Google makes this app to be put on Android devices. It's called Action Blocks. When you install Action Blocks, it allows you to make boxes on your home screen that will launch things. Or if you look at the picture on the screen now on the left, um, that's my Android tablet. It has a simple AAC layout on the, on the front screen with icons and text and speech output. You can set that up. You can also set up an action block to do other things. So when you tap that app, in addition to those icons that you can change with, with speech in them. So this is showing how to edit one. I can change the picture, the tag, and then finally what gets spoken out loud from the um, box. One of the interesting things about your action blocks is you can yes. also set up an action block to do, I'm waiting to get to this little, you can have a block set up to make a phone call or start a video call, send a text message, play a video, play something from music. It can turn on lights in your environment. So these blocks can perform tasks also. So now we have a little bit of a, of a extension of what the blocks can do. And you can set up a whole screen. If, if you were to see my tablet that's there on that picture, if I was to swipe to the right, you would just see all the other apps that are on my, my on my Android tablet there that I can select. But if I swipe to the left, that page is all my action blocks. So I can simply get to them from the home screen. It's a great app. Maybe I'm hoping one day we'll get an iOS app that is the same because I love that. I think action blocks are really great tool. It's one of the reasons that made me buy an Android tablet because it's that cool. Really neat. Love it. I love it. Let's cycle through some more. Windows, your PCs. You have features also. Go to settings, go to ease of access. You have the same type of, type of things. You have text-to-speech and screen reading from a tool called Narrator, which will do the same thing as some of these other tools will. Magnifiers, captions, high contrast. Um, text, the adjusting of text and making font larger. You have all those features. What's interesting about Windows and Microsoft, Microsoft has taken a little bit of a change of how they're approaching things, and they're not really building many more features into their operating system, but instead they are building features into their tools. It's really kind of cool. Like I think it's an interesting the, idea. The ed and learning tools, this is, it's exciting. Like it's yeah. right there and whatever... I mean, we use so many Microsoft apps, this makes sense, right? Yeah, so now if you want to have a website read aloud, you don't have to turn on the features of your PC. You go right into the Edge browser and you pull down the settings menu and there's a button that says read aloud and it will just read that page to you. It's built in. Jen mentioned the learning tools, an immersive reader. Amazing, amazing. It's a way to provide some support for people who need that support in reading has three menus. I'll show you screen captures of each menu. Uh, you have a reading menu, which allows you to have things read out loud and you can change font size and style. You can uh, change the spacing on a page. You can change the color of the backgrounds. So you have some themes you can put in. So visually, it's gonna be easier to um, see that text as it's being read aloud, you have this kind of grammar tab, which I, this is like one of those things, I don't know if anything else really does this. It's impressive. I mean, it's it's really cool as far as pulling out those parts of speech and code. it's great. Yeah, so you can see in the, in the picture there, I can click a button and it will break words into syllables. So as I'm hearing them read, I can see the syllable breakdown of each word as I'm learning to read, provide me some additional support. Uh, and then you have the parts of speech that you can color code. 
so that that individual starts to recognize nouns as they're listening to something, verbs as they're listening to something. I, so cool. It's great. It's great, right? And then finally, you have the last one, which um, gives me the ability to adjust the line focus so I can mask out everything on the screen except one or three lines. I have a picture dictionary support, and then it has built-in translation. This is into, a big video. Yeah, so many, like, how many different languages? I was going to say over 100, I'm going to guess. Mm -hmm. And it will give you the option to see the original text and then flip it to the other language that you selected. Many of the languages have a voice that goes with it, so it will be able to read. Now, not every language has a voice. But what it will do is change the text. So if perhaps the person that you're working with is fluent in another language, maybe having the speech output might not be as critical for them for some of those languages. And that's just a, a question of um, developers creating the um, text-to-speech engines for the, some of these languages. We just haven't gotten them all yet. But all of that is built into the tool called Immersive Reader, which lives across the Microsoft products. That's what this chart illustrates. This chart is a lot. Let me orient you to this chart. This chart on the left-hand side in that blue column is all of those features we just showed you. This is so the read nice. aloud space. What's that? So nice for set framework planning. Oh okay. my, so what do you need? Here's your feature <laughs> parts of speech, line that? focus. Yes. They're all know. right there. And then as you go across the row, uh, it will tell you what tools that lives in. Now, I'm going to take a second and say, while I love the idea of the features being built into the tools, what I don't love is that some versions of the same tool don't have all the features. If you use Microsoft Word on the web, you have all those features. If you use Microsoft Word on an iPad as an app, all you have is read aloud spacing and page colors. Yeah. So that's a bit of a struggle. It's tricky. So it, it this chart constantly changes. Microsoft puts this chart out um, because it's important to recognize where these things live. And so just having Microsoft tools doesn't automatically give you all the features. So that's just kind of a word of warning, a word of caution. Just know that that could potentially happen. And it requires you to do a little more digging to make sure the version of the tool you're using has the features you want. And there was, hold that thought, I'll come back to it. There was a Chrome extension that allowed you to install Immersive Reader into your Chrome browser to use it to read. So now you'd have all those features on a Chromebook in the browser. But that app is that that extension is not working anymore. I know there were some updates to Immersive Reader, and I think those updates disconnected it from this extension, and now it doesn't work. So what I would say to you is know that it's called that. It's called Use Immersive Reader on websites. You search for it in the Chrome Web Store, uh, and then kind of do what I'm doing is I just check it every once in a while to see if it's working. And I'm hoping that it's going to come back at some point because that was a really powerful way to have students working on a Chromebook but have all the features of Immersive Reader, regardless of where they were. So hopefully that will come soon, come back and, and be functional for us one more time. Oh. All right, we'll jump through Chrome and then we'll wrap this up. We appreciate you watching this all the way through. Um, we didn't say it before, but now might be a good time. As we go through each section, Maybe it gave a natural spot to pause and go explore a little bit and come back, but too late to say that now. If you got here, we're at the last one. Hang tough. We're almost done. Um, yeah, they'll have a recording and they'll have the slides and they can go the slides, through you'll have the recording. and really digest each piece based on the device that a student has or that they yeah, have. So. For sure. And go back to these chunks and then see them as you go back. One of the things that we think when we talk about Chromebooks in schools, we see them in schools a lot. They are great. Uh, they are very powerful tools. I, Jen knows I am a huge Chromebook pusher. It is my everyday computer. I love my Chromebook. Um, but when we get into a school, one of the things that could potentially provide a barrier for our students 
is the fact that in the Chromebook, the students are in a managed environment, meaning they log into it and then an administrator allows them access to features. Sometimes what happens is they don't have access to the accessibility features, which mm. allow them to customize their experience. And so what we like to point out to administrators, district administrators, IT departments, is if you go into your Chrome administrator console, you can turn on a button under the settings under accessibility and the button says, show the, the accessibility options in the system menu. Once you turn that on, the students can go down to the bottom of the page where the time is, click there, and they get a button that says accessibility. You click that button, they get all the features available to them to toggle on and off. What we've done is given them the, the uh, ability to adjust their own experience without having them go into the settings, which is what we're typically trying to keep them out of anyway. So it's a very simple solution. If you're on your own computer, your own Chromebook on your own account, you could go in and turn this on too. And now your accessibility would show up at the bottom of your screen simply with a click. It's always the first thing we talk about. Features, kind of the same, especially when we start thinking about the features of a Chromebook and an Android device, which are both owned by Google. So they're gonna start to sound the same. In um, your Chromebook, you have something called select to speak, kind of like in your Android. It gives you an icon at the bottom of the screen when you turn it on. So at the bottom right corner, there's a little speaker icon. I go and I click it. I move up to any text and I select it with my cursor. And it reads. Daniel H. Pink, the number one best-selling author of Drive and to Sell. You'll notice it gives you a pink highlight box around what you've selected. And then the word being spoken is highlighted in another color. That's the built-in text-to-speech of your Chromebook. It's great. It's fantastic. It works in quite a few places. It's very powerful. Mm. One of the other things that's it's fairly new-ish to Chrome and their accessibility is the ability to have dictation everywhere on your device. If you're a Google um, Docs user, you probably know you have voice typing in Google Docs. Turn that on, use the microphone to dictate in. But if you're not in Google Docs, you lose that feature. So there is a built-in feature called dictation, which gives you a microphone at the bottom of the screen, which then allows you to dictate anywhere. As long as their cursor will show up for typing, you can turn the microphone on and dictate in there. Suddenly incredibly powerful. That gives you the functionality to move through it. Want a screen reader? Sure. Chrome has one. If you do your Chromebook, it is called Chrome Vox. And it is the screen reader built into your Chromebook. Um, I would say watch this, this video, one of the better ones in here. This was made by the Google team. Uh, and it's great. And it gives you all the features of Chrome Vox of how to use that screen reader functionality on your Chromebook. Switches, also there. This was one of the newer updated features that Chrome rolled out maybe last year. Uh, was a fairly intensive update to their switch settings, which make them very, very good. Excellent. Surprisingly good. Maybe not iOS good, but close though, but really close. Multiple switches, automatic scanning, uh, moving through the device and allowing you access to control the whole device with an alternate access um, method switch outside. Really very good. So you could pair your Chromebook with a Bluetooth switch so you don't need that intermediary step. Oh, right. So now if you have a Bluetooth switch, you just simply need the switch and your Chromebook and link them together and you'll have access to everything, which is great. Some of the other built-in accessibility, we added these in. These don't show up in the accessibility settings, but yet here they are and their accessibility. Live captions. We talked about it on an Android phone. Um, this idea of audio coming out of your device, having captions for it. You can do that in Google Slides as automatic captions. So 
on our screen right now, we're in Google Slides. I can move down to the bottom where the slide sorter is, and I can open up some options and I can select captions. And now the captions will show up on the screen as I'm presenting my Google Slides. Now in Zoom, as we run Zoom, the captions are controlled through Zoom. And so you're seeing that, so we don't run them here as well, but you could. And you could also start doing this as, as, a, as a new habit for accessibility every time you present from a Google slide presentation, because it is just best practice. Put this up there so that people have access to the text as they're listening to something. So that's your captions in your Google Slides. If you're using the Chrome browser and your Chrome browser is version 89 or above, you can turn on live captions. So any audio, any audio that plays on your browser will automatically have a caption box pop up. Now I say version 89 because I know in some schools they don't update frequently. So even though version 89 has come out now more than a year ago, hmm. there may be some instances where your school has just not updated your Chrome browser yet for everyone. And so go into your settings if you're able to get there, get about and see what version of Chrome you're running and then talk to your support staff, your IT support. Is it possible to update Chrome so that we get access to the live caption feature? And one more that's not really an accessibility feature, but I love it. I love it. It is an accessibility feature. It is an executive function support. And it <laughs> is something that allows you to group your tabs in your browser. Jen knows I love this. She's always sees my computer and it has tabs across the entirety of the top row. Um, any tabs you have open, if you want to lump them together under a colored tab, simply right click on that tab. You can click add to a group and that will put it in a group that you already have created, or you could create a new group and those will add it in. And then every tab you add in will just find itself um, set underneath that colored tab. So at any point I can click and open and close colored tabs on my screen. So I see all those tabs or I reduce them and don't see any of them. Projects, multiple classes, maybe if you're working with a student, each of their subjects has a bunch of open tabs, but when they're not in that class, they collapse them so they don't see them anymore. Maybe that's a strategy. Love it. I, I don't think I could live without this feature. I love this feature. So great. We've given you a snapshot of these. Now, we remind you there are many more of them features, you should go in and dig around, but we're going to also challenge you with a bit of a call to action of how do you find a way to tell others about this? This is what will start to make change with technology, is using these tools that are easy and readily available and free to change people's perceptions of technology and accessible technology. And so our challenge to you is think about who are three people you could show this to or share this link with um, or say, hey, did you know your iPhone reads out loud to you? Think about what this would look like in an environment where you're supporting individuals. What does this look like? How could we fold these features into the environment to support them and then finally, in kind of a capacity approach to things, what do you need to do to support others in order for them to use this? Because our goal would be you tell three people, they tell three people, and then those next people tell three people. Suddenly we have all of these people learn about these features and the idea of accessibility in technology becomes something that is a reality and not just something that, well, I don't know anything about that. This is something everybody can know about and can share. Absolutely. Well, we've done it, everybody. We've done it. We gave you a snapshot of this. Don't forget the slides. This is the link to the slides, bit.ly slash N-H-A-T dash A-1-1-Y. We'll get you to these slides. Uh, 
you've already gotten to the video if you're watching it. So good, good job. Uh, and uh, we thank you for your time. If you need anything related to assistive tech and you are in New Hampshire, reach out to us. There's our email address, nhatconnect at gmail.com. It's our website, nhatconnect.com. This recording and all the others that we do live there as well. And you'll get a taste of all of the services that we're doing um, across the state to support individuals uh, with disabilities. So thanks for your time today. Jen, thank you. Mike, thank you. That was so much information. So good. So well laid out. Such great resources. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.